Hello, and welcome to All Hands on Tech, where today's leaders talk tomorrow's technology. I'm Daniel Blazer. Tech companies are continuously searching for and hiring top-tier talent, but what happens after they're hired? How do you empower them to be the best in their craft? It starts at the top. Jeremy Morgan recently led a panel discussion on this topic with world-class engineering leaders. Among other topics, they discuss fostering growth in uncomfortable conditions, aligning team members around common goals, and creating a culture of learning and psychological safety. Now, managing tech teams is easy, but leading them is difficult. In today's ultra-competitive environment, you need your tech teams to be on top of their game, both in output and in innovation. Tech talent is a differentiator in most industries, but hiring talented people on the team is only part of the puzzle. Leaders need to foster growth with a psychologically safe environment and rally their teams around common goals. So how does a leader create a space for their teams to thrive? Today, we're talking with three veteran engineering leaders to break down their approach and help their teams grow. Dragana Hajik is an agile coach and a consultant and a senior manager with Levi9. Dragana, would you like to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself? Yes, sure. Hello, everyone. Well, uh, as Jeremy mentioned, my name is Dragana Hadric and I'm a consultant. Um, most of my career, um, I've been actually helping teams and organizations to succeed in uh, their goals. So this is something that I'm really passionate about. I'm originally also coming from a software engineering uh, background, uh, but most of my career, I was working in a role of uh, agile coach, uh, leader of management teams, uh, project and delivery manager. Uh, and yes, I'm also a plural site author. Then we have Michael Rasmussen, who's a VP of Engineering at Sling TV. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So, um, yeah, I'm VP of Engineering at Sling. We, we have about 3 million uh, subscribers to our live TV service. Uh, I run a team of about 200 engineers, uh, scrum masters, product owners, product managers. Um, and we are currently going through a, a really difficult transformation from, from feature teams to empowered product teams. Um, and really having kind of full cross-functional ownership of the entire value stream. Uh, it's, it's a lot of hard work, uh, but I think we're making some good progress. Um, my previous background is actually mostly in the game industry. I worked for companies like EA and Zynga and led transformations like this there. Uh, and yeah, I'm happy to be here. Spencer Gardner is a co-founder and VP, engineering, VP of engineering at Tava Health. And would you like to introduce yourself, Spencer? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks again for having me on. Um, I wish I was a portal site author. That's one of my new goals, uh, Dragana. So thanks for <laughs> setting the standard. Um, yeah, uh, Spencer Gardner, I uh, started uh, Tava Health uh, about a year ago with a couple of co-founders. And uh, we're an online uh, mental health network that we sell as a benefit to employers uh, to provide to their employees. Uh, super passionate about uh, how mental health affects all of us in our daily lives. It's a rising crisis that's uh, it's really affecting everyone in this world, I feel like. Uh, and there's lots of statistics to back that up. So it's just been an awesome experience uh, starting this company, um, building it from the ground up and uh, kind of connecting technology with uh, helping people with their mental health. Um, before that, I was at uh, Artemis Health, one of the early people there, um, leading the product engineering team. And I um, had a great experience taking that, uh, taking that business uh, quite a ways and it's, it's doing pretty well. And then I had some brief stints at Microsoft and doing some user experience design at Rain Agency and uh, a competitive distance runner. And so that's something that keeps me going uh, during the day. For our first question, and anyone can answer this, what does fostering growth mean to you? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I, I think that, that fostering growth to me means um, really kind of unlocking the potential of your team, um, in particular engineers. Uh, there's quite a lot of data to show that uh, the some of the best insights and innovations actually come from, from engineers, those that are closest to the problems that, that we're trying to solve. Um, and, and all too often, engineering teams are, are, are feature teams. Um, the highest paid person comes up with a list of things that they want done, and then we have to somehow figure out how to fit that into the capacity. And that is fundamentally the wrong way to run things. Um, and, and I think that the right way to run things and the, and the right way to foster growth is to unleash the potential of, of the teams, of the folks that are closest to the problems. How do you foster an ownership mentality among everyone so to, to really get people engaged and involved? 
I think that basically um, ownership mentality is there if people are uh, motivated, if they have the goals that are clear to them, uh, that they buy the goals and that they also have some uh, personal, uh, let's say, interest in um, achieving those goals. Um, and not from the interest perspective, but uh, that they have a wish that these goals are achieved. So basically, depending on um, how much ownership is there, uh, people are getting motivated. It's very important factor in people motivation. So I think once we have motivation in place, that basically uh, everything is about uh, transparency and making enough space uh, for people to work. And when they um, have this opportunity, uh, then they will basically be uh, triggered by that and they will achieve the goals um, themselves. Uh, when we don't have this element in place, then we need to think more about um, how to establish authority. But personally, uh, in my opinion, I'm always more for the approach to basically develop the, the culture where we have ownership mentality um, rather than establishing some more traditional, let's say, authority. I'll just add on to that as well, that uh, especially you know with my background and spending lots of time in, in younger, uh, more scrappy sort of situations with startups, focusing on vision and mission first, like what is the kernel? What is the kernel of this business? What are we getting at? Uh, and in, in my case right now, it's improving people's mental health, which that's that's a kind of an easy thing uh, I feel like for people to relate with and and to start taking ownership of in their day to day engineering or product development. It might not be always be as altruistic. It might be uh, improving some business software. It might be trying to streamline um, um, other uh, other parts of someone's uh, workflow. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that again coming back to the core foundational aspects of why the business was founded and mm -hmm. what the mission really is. Uh, can really can really help people to find ownership in a way that makes sense to them. And if they're not aligned with that, it's going to be hard to align them with really anything in the business. I think the ownership piece is is so important. Um, I think that the, having having everybody on the team have a very clear focus, and, and a focus is not priority. Priority is a list of things. A focus is like there are two to three things that we are focused on, and these are the outcomes that we really want to drive. That that is where you can unlock ownership. Um, I don't think you get ownership when you say, here's our list of 80 things. Um, they're stack ranked, so you know the priority. That doesn't drive ownership. Um, ownership is around outcomes, not output. Uh, and, and so I think it is actually on the leaders. I think it's, it's easy to say, hey, we need our teams to have ownership. But if there's an ownership problem, it's a management and a leadership problem. It's usually not the problem of, of the folks on the team. Most of them want ownership. Um, and it's actually, we have to put the structure in place and the alignment around the outcomes in place to have ownership. Otherwise, it, it won't happen. It can't happen. I fully agree that all people want to have ownership. All people want to have purpose of their work. They want to get engaged. So, um, yes, we just need to ena enable them to, to, be, to do that. And are there different approaches at different sizes of organizations? So if you're trying to get your group to focus on the why, like you said, focus on the outcomes. Is that a, a different approach? Say if you're a, a, a large company, a big, large organization between a small startup? Yeah, it's really interesting to ask that question. So my career started at Microsoft and then it transitioned really quickly into a, uh, at the very beginning stages of a startup. And uh, that was a really interesting transition that I will say uh, did come with some implications in terms of uh, understanding what the mission of the company was, understanding what the goals really were. Um, and, and actually one of the reasons that I, I felt personally like it was difficult for me uh, in the current team I was at Microsoft was because I didn't feel like I had a, a clear path towards achieving some real objective that I felt like I could really change. Um, and uh, I don't think that's necessarily true for Microsoft as a whole, but, but or big companies as a whole. Um, but in my particular situation, that was the case. But then transitioning uh, right into uh, into Artemis Health, uh, it was they gave me a laptop and said, "Hey, this is what we're trying to solve. Here's a laptop. Let's go do it." And uh, that was immediately clear. Uh, uh, and I almost had immediate ownership. If I didn't if I didn't perform, then the company wouldn't exist, pretty much. And I think fostering that sort of idea amongst uh, employees, even in a medium sized business or large business, uh, I think is really effective. I think conceptually it's the same. 
I think um, in practice, it's a lot more difficult uh, uh, the larger organization you have to scale that because what you're really trying to capture is that two pizza team feel of, of a startup, you know, and, and I've been in a startup and, and it's really, really easy to have um, have that alignment because you're all sitting right next to each other and you're saying, hey, this is our goal and it's on the wall. And ultimately, that's exactly what you're trying to recreate at a larger organization is that is, is that alignment and that ownership and and kind of the scale of the teams where they're where they're the right size that they can move quickly. Um, so there's a lot of, I think, approaches on, on how to do that at a larger organization. Um, but ultimately, it's it's you're trying to recreate that same feeling that you have at a startup. Yes, basically, I think in a startup, it comes naturally. So everyone is aware of what we want to achieve. We are all part of this. We, yeah, we are just doing it together. And in a larger organization, you just need to put some uh, mechanism or to um, introduce some effort into basically aligning everyone's uh, individual contribution to the bigger picture. But uh, there are some very successful mechanisms for that. So I don't think there are obstacles. It's just about different uh, yeah, different way to organize things. What do you define as uncomfortable conditions for engineers in your organization? Uncomfortable, uh, we're going through a lot of change right now. Um, and I think uncomfortable uh, conditions happen when um, when you're not uh, taking advantage of your of your engineering talent. I, th I think the way that things ran when I got here, for example, was that Jira basically ran our business. Um, an engineer would come in on, on, a, on a given day and he'd go and see what tickets were assigned to him. And and it was a very uh, mercenary attitude. Engineers don't like working like that. Engineers like being missionaries. They like understanding the vision. They like understanding where they're going. Um, so I think any anytime you're working in, in a feature factory or, or like a mercenary type organization, you have to put in a whole bunch of other things to kind of manage people and get them excited and get them motivated. You can unlock their intrinsic intrinsic motivations by by making it a missionary organization and and by aligning them with with the out with 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 outcomes rather than output. Basically, being like a firefighter that's always solving problems, um, things like that. That kind of stress can lead up to making things uncomfortable, if I'm understanding correctly. But if you if you get them building features and doing things that that are improving the business and trying to improve that mix, does that yeah. help? Make yeah, and let me let me yeah, kind of just further thoughts there. You know, I think we have, for example, we have we have a lot of production a uh, production burden. So we have you know three million subscribers. We have to keep the lights on. There's there's a lot of work involved in keeping the systems up and running. They're very complex. They're a distributed system. It's a non-trivial problem. Um, and so you know, there's just sort of that baseline level of thing that has to happen. In addition to that, we have to find a way to prioritize new features and innovation. And that just is, it's its a constant ongoing battle. Um, and I think we have to be in a position where we invest in the infrastructure and we invest in, in the technology that, that, that allows us to move more quickly. Um, and, and going through that transition, it's, it's hard. It's really hard on an engineering team. Um, when you have disruptive changes on the horizon, how do you guys prepare your teams for those changes? So I know a lot of times like the digital transformation, it seems like it's happening everywhere. You know, there's digital transformation, and then there's culture transformations that kind of happen at the same time, you know, as organizations are moving from, you know, on-prem to the cloud, or they're moving to a mobile app instead of a traditional desktop app or things like that. Um, so how do you prepare your team to address those drastic changes? I, I think that uh, a really practical thing uh, that, that I've done in the past is having hack days. That's getting, you know, really, really specific, really quick. But um, I think that it's on the mind of most of the engineers in the organization. I know it's on my mind every day. I'm thinking about what's coming up next, what the new challenges are, what the new tech is. And you read about it, you know, on your Twitter feed or, you know, wherever you are, in your Y Combinator feed, whatever. Um, and you see these technologies coming through and everyone's kind of talking about them, but maybe doesn't have any experience using them. And so one of the just the really practical mechanisms that I've used is just having a hack day or a couple days where engineers can can take a, a business oriented problem and then try to match it with some new disruptive technology or some new approach to solving that issue um, just to kind of build the confidence and to get a little bit of that experience uh, uh, with that new concept that's that's more on a practical level there's also larger you know disruptive uh, things that are happening that you wouldn't necessarily have a hack day for but that's just uh, that's just one idea I think 
without having to invest a ton and without having to commit to something long term, you can just spend a couple of days looking at it. From my experience in tech leadership, there's always certain types of people on the team. And there's usually one person that's very resistant to change in technology. And generally, that's the person that's been around the longest and knows the most about the system. So you can't discount their their opinion. And they're like, well, why are we chasing this new fad? And why are we chasing the new thing? And so I, I found the hack days or just the, you know, let's sit down with Angular for today and build something together type of thing um, helps a lot to kind of break down those barriers and help people see you know, this is why we're changing to this new thing. Um, Cause you know, you usually have one person on the team that wants to do all the latest and greatest things. And then one person on the team that's like, why are we changing what we're doing now? <laughs> you know, right. so. And if yeah, you're at the absolutely. point where you've decided we need to make the change, there's, I mean, there's quite a few frameworks out there for, for managing change, but they're all some variant of starting with awareness. Like, Hey, this is why we're, you know, starting with the why this is why we're going to do this. Then moving to knowledge or the, you know, this is this is how we're going to do this. And then moving to the ability of, you know, this is this is what we're going to do. We recently did a big DevOps transformation. And at the same time, we're transitioning an old monolithic uh, system to microservices. And it was, you know, there's no way we could have done this in, in one single hit. We had to have this kind of constant heartbeat of starting with the awareness. This is why we're doing it. And then, and then moving to the knowledge. Okay. We want to enable everybody and help them get the skills necessary and develop those skills. And then, and then we can map out how we actually do this. Um, and, and in some instances that it takes a little bit more time um, in, in particular with a large organization to, to go through that kind of change. How much runway do you give your team to, to shape the approach taken with the with the disruptive technology mm. as it comes in, like for a DevOps transformation, for instance. Yeah, so I can I can speak to DevOps. Um, the unfortunate reality is that it uh, in some of these transformations it, it takes years. Um, you know, with with larger organizations, it, it, it can take years. Um, it, but but I think that there's some quick things you can do right away. Uh, you know, so if you've got a system that's that's legacy like ours, um, uh, and and you're trying to to completely automate the the CI/CD pipeline, that's a that's a lot of work. It's going to take a long time. But what you what you can do is you can start changing the mentality and the culture right away, and shifting left on on things like QA and and ops and and starting to integrate those teams and. Um, say, hey, we got to. We have to solve these problems together. We we don't get to throw this over the wall anymore. Um, we're we're breaking down silos, and and this is our goal. This is our, where we ultimately want to go. So it kind of goes back to that same thing. We have to articulate this goal. Like this is where we want to go. This is how we're going to measure it. Um, and then and then we're going to start to give you the knowledge and the ability and the training and everything necessary to actually drive in that direction. Yeah, I, I think it really depends on what the uncomfortable situation is and uh, what your teams, what is the current state of your teams. Uh, but uh, maybe it sounds too simple, but I think in general, we should give no more or no less time than it is actually needed to make things right, you know. So, um uh, for example, I work with a lot of agile teams and in uh, normal circumstances, uh, what I'm looking of as one of the metrics is uh, focus factor. And I think when everything is normal, when people are, people are productive, um, but then I'm looking that I... Uh, they, they need approximately 80% of the time to work on their current tasks and then 20% for meetings, uh, emails or whatever is needed. So this is something that is like um, standard when everything is okay. But with any small change, it can simply, um, you know, people can lose focus with additional 20% or something. And if we are talking about big change, it's completely different. So I think... Uh, however, time is needed, no more or no less than we actually need to make things work. So, how do you keep your keep your team motivated and and hungry for for new things? Maybe just a couple of specific examples. I think we could talk broadly too. But um, I I think in general, it's it's really important to uh, focus on small wins. It's very important that you don't celebrate only at the very end of a big project or big initiative. Um, if you do that, then chances are that people will be burnt out by the end of it, or you might not even get there. Um, so uh, what, one popular uh, uh, idea that sales teams have is that, that sales gong, 
um, <laughs> that they'll use sometimes when they make a big sale. Um, so I had a small gong that I got, uh, and you know, on small releases or small updates, we kind of when we when we shipped the update, we would we would hit the gong, uh, and that was but that was just the, the principle of it was celebrating that next step towards success, and it was something that was kind of wonky, kind of funny, um, but also did help the team to rally around something um, and, and celebrate a little bit. Uh, another thing at, at Tava that we do is, um, at, you know, as important milestones in our business come up with um, patient volume and with people and patients seeing uh, a therapists at a certain volume, then I've actually um, uh, written some written some code that will actually notify us in Slack uh, when good things happen on our system. Super small, um, but again, during the day when you get that Slack notification that notifies you of a win for the business, um, that really helps. Uh, keep people going. That sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, no, like I think in general, things. these small wins are really uh, important. Um, I think there are two dimensions. We need to keep an eye on small things. So this is what, uh, you know, what is our everyday work. And um, from the other side, we need always to have this big why, why we are doing it, what is the big goal, uh, as Michael uh, mentioned earlier. So this why or like long-term goal is very important also for teams. What's the difference between communicating company goals and objectives versus um, having them focus on the on the why? So I, I think if you do it right, there there is no difference. Um, you know, so we, we're actually rolling out OKRs, um, which I actually don't think OKRs are, are a great um, methodology for aligning unless you actually have empowered product teams um, and the OKRs aren't going through managers, but they're going through product um, and you have very active managers. Otherwise, I think it's actually kind of distracting. Um, but I think if you... If you do a really good job of, of company goals, then then that is the why, uh, and, and that is that is the and it all ties up to you know. So for us, we have a product we have a mission for the company, we have a product vision, which gets a one additional level of granularity down that very clearly states this is where we want our product to be five years from now. Then we have OKRs, which are here's how what we're going to focus on in the next one to two years that are very, very why focused. Like we want, we want to have better engagement with our, with our watchers for X reason. Um, and why? Because it, it leads to this. So, you know, so they're very focused on the why. And then every team has their OKRs that, that ladder up to those OKRs. So I think that's really, really hard to do. Um, but I think if, if you do that, then, then the why and the goals are the same. I think it's a bit also about wording and uh, uh, communicating is also fine. This is perfect. But for me, when I say just communicate, uh, it initially sounds as, you know, one way street. So you inform people or communicate this to them. And when I think about alignment, then I think about bringing everyone into agreement. And even if these are like um, bigger goals, long term goals, uh, I think that people can still develop the sense of ownership if they can, for example, if you have an objective and then uh, a person has an idea about initiative, how they can contribute to the objective, they are already building the ownership. And then when we build this together, I think it's um, really alignment. This is yeah, the real thing. But uh, as I mentioned, it's also about wording. Communicating is also fine. I mean, no. And so who should create the OKRs? Should that be the engineers, um, leadership, or kind of a combination of the two? So there's some very clear uh, best practices around OKRs. And I've unfortunately been at companies where they, they have OKRs and, and they're actually pretty unhealthy. Um, I think, I think OKRs should be done with engineering and product together, and they should be aligned around product teams, not managers. So for example, I've been to places where I, my boss has an OKR and then I have an OKR, but some people on my team are on product teams. And, and then it's like, which OKR are you actually? And I think that's, that's a mess. Um, I think the way to do it is have for your overall business have OKRs, and then each product team, which is focused on some sort of uh, vertical experience, they have OKRs and those teams may be composed of people from different departments, um, but it can very quickly mushroom into something that's confusing and um, actually detrimental. 
so I think you have to have a lot of discipline to do it right. Yeah, yeah. sure. You should keep it simple. I think with OKRs, I think they are fine, but basically they are just uh, a way to achieve um, the alignment and to bring everyone together to the same goal. So it's uh, one technique. I, sometimes with teams, I use a very simple technique that is uh, impact mapping. So um, it has some similar elements to OKR. So I find that sometimes it works, but uh, as I mentioned, I think those are only, let's say, uh, techniques. It's important what we want to achieve. We want to bring everyone together, you know, heading yeah. in the same direction with the feeling of ownership. So, how do you align separate departments and divisions? Um, like you were talking about, like with product and engineering, um, how do you align those together if they're, mm -hmm. you know, fairly siloed in nature? How do you well, get them aligned and, and kind of moving towards the same set of goals? Well, I think there is a structure and a culture there. So looking at the structure, uh, for example, in the environment where I work, so uh, we have departments, but we also work as agile cross-functional teams where different people from different departments are in agile teams. So uh, in that way, they all have a common goal and they have a collective accountability to, del to deliver something so it's basically one mechanism of alignment between different departments. And then uh, when talking about company culture, it's about growing the values of uh, openness, transparency, about, you know, simple things, as uh, Spencer mentioned, uh, hackathons, uh, knowledge sharing groups, uh, um, presentations, everything that brings people together around some common goals. So um, and to encourage that kind of behavior. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think. I'd also add just uh, finding some way to foster empathy amongst departments. And that sounds a little bit weird because a department having an em empathy for another department is kind of a, an interesting abstract concept. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, oftentimes I find that, yeah, it's, it's just uh, from, you know, a manager of a department to the manager of another department, like that empathy sometimes isn't there, that communication isn't there. And I think that's a, a very common um, misstep is just to not communicate, not understand what the, what the issues of that other department is dealing with. Um, and then, yeah, just a second when Dragana said, I think once you understand that, those, those issues and you have the empathy for the other department or uh, there's interdepartmental empathy that's built, then you can start looking at, oh, what projects can we do together? How can we, how can we help each other even in a small capacity to start with? Um, and it starts a flywheel, I think, of productivity and communication within the business. Um, and I, I don't know about uh, the rest of you. I, I just really dislike the culture of one department sometimes having a competition with the other. Um, that, that tends to happen sometimes. Sometimes engineers will complain that salespeople are selling ahead of the engineers or the product people. Um, and sometimes the salespeople will complain that the engineers or product people aren't quite fast enough. And uh, I think it's just really toxic to a culture. Um, and, I, and I've seen that in lots of different places. And I think that, again, yeah, coming back to empathy, understanding the issues and then working together instead of trying to work uh, in kind of an orthogonally, then uh, things go a lot better. Yeah. At, at my last gig, I was actually VP of product, um, not VP of engineering. Um, so I think that the kind of product and engineering, it's absolutely critical that they're that they work together. And, and I think the best way to do that is with cross-functional teams um, yep. that are that are fully cross-functional, that actually do own the entire value chain. So that includes product design, engineering, QA, ops, and in includes all of the departments. Um, and then and then really the departments are just sort of the HR management of those teams, but that's where the actual work happens is on those cross-functional teams. Um, and if they truly are empowered and they're truly aligned, with with OKRs or impact mapping or whatever you use to to kind of align on on the objectives, then I think that's when the magic happens because I think then they move really really quickly and there's a lot of things that have to be in place as well. You have to have a platform that can support that from a technology standpoint and you have to have the right processes in place. Um, it's really four things: it's processes and procedures, it's culture, it's the org structure, and it's technology. And you have to have all four of them for it to work. And what kind of changes um, have you folks seen over the years in things like that, like procedures and org structures and things like that? I, I know personally, I, I've seen a pretty drastic difference even in the last 10 years of how organizations that, that I've been with are set up. Um, what are some kind of big changes that you folks have seen? 
So I started my career a long time ago before Agile. Um, so when I was a software engineer, um, we would do completely like comprehensive design documentation. Uh, so the design process actually happened in this huge chunk before we wrote any software. Uh, and then we would go in a very waterfall manner and then write the software and then go and then, and, and so I think the lead time from an idea to when it actually hit customers was years. So I think, I think ultimately it's all been about shrinking that lead time. Um, and, and then I've seen people that implement agile, but it's more agile fall. It's actually, they're still just doing waterfall, <laughs> but they have scrum and they have standups and, and they're not actually um, doing quick iterations on that whole design build, um, you know, release measure cycle. They're actually just doing what they used to do, but they're, they're calling it something different. And I think, I think the real transformation is when you truly do move into agile teams, truly cross-functional teams that truly do own the entire value chain. Um, and, you know, they go from releasing, you know, a couple times a year to releasing multiple times a day. Uh, and and I, I think that transformation, which you can call DevOps, which you can call agile is, is, is I think, the biggest transformation that I've seen. Yes, I, I recognize what you're saying, Michael. So I was also working as a software engineer in more traditional setting. I was also working as a project manager in a more traditional setting and then, um, uh, yeah, moved to agile, etc. And the main um, difference that I see is that um, way back then it was more focused on processes and now it's more focused on the value, which is really great on the outcomes. So I think it's a big step forward. So if implemented, I, I think a lot of companies say that, but don't actually do it. Um, I, I it's see really more and more really uh, that people are really focusing on value, value and outcomes. I think it's yeah. just what is coming. So everything is becoming more complex, faster, technology is advanced, etc. So it's just, um, I think is necessity. So I really see that uh, in more and more environments, really people yeah. are focused on value. I agree. Yeah, and I think showing value is probably the easiest way to get adoption. Um, I was a software engineer when Agile first started really becoming popular in groups and people were very slow to adapt to it. You know, I was also in the, the waterfall type groups, you know, where we do a deploy every six months. And as soon as the results started showing up from changing certain processes, that's when that's when the resistors were like, okay, there's, there may be something here, you know? But and I would, I would say there's actually ongoing transformation that needs to happen. I, I think agile in some ways has actually made some problems worse. There are teams that are really good at, at churning out a whole bunch of features. Have they actually aligned those features with customers? Are they actually doing customer discovery or are they just executing on a list of whatever the highest person um, told them to do? Yes. So I think this is also the next thing. So what I see is that most of companies are now really good at um, agile processes, delivery processes. So um, teams are working in an agile, agile manner, et cetera. But now where focus is shifting more to uh, product side. So also to make the planning uh, agile, also to make, uh, to validate assumptions, to basically update the goals and to adjust the goals according to what is going on in the world. So uh, I think that focus is shifting there definitely. And it's a really good thing. From a management perspective, I, th I think more is required. Well, maybe not more, but a different, sort of set of skills is required of managers now than was maybe 10 years ago or 15 mm. years ago needs to be a little bit more dynamic needs to be a little less i'm a cog in a big in a big machine and i will just do my thing and and you know turn through the waterfall of, of tasks um it, it really does require um uh thinking differently as a manager and um uh and I think that that's where, like, there's no silver bullet, of course, you know, um, there's lots of lots of things online. I think, I'm sure Dragon knows all, all sorts about this. Lots of discussion online about is Agile a silver bullet, you know, and this, this kind of conversation about what's the silver bullet. And of course, there is none, right? It's just, it's merely an approach, but it is one that seems to be uh, popularized among the community right now. And we're learning a lot as an industry about uh, how it is helping us. But of course, on top of that, the cherry on top as a manager is you need to understand the core principles um, of business and of what you're doing and why you're doing it first, um, and then apply the, the agile methodology, for example, to be productive. 
Yeah. So when building teams and putting together teams, um, what are some specific traits that you're looking for in your team members? I'll, I'll just jump in first. Um, obviously, pretty big topic, right? And we could talk probably for a couple couple days or weeks about it. But uh, one of my favorite, favorite things that I, that I saw uh, recently, uh, well, it was about a year ago, but it was a tweet. And it said, culture ad is greater than culture fit. Um, and you could agree or disagree with it. Um, but I saw it and I really loved it because for so many years, uh, that's been part of the conversation with hiring. Okay, do they fit our culture? Do they fit our culture? And uh, I think it's not an either or sort of thing, of course. Um, but I really liked uh, switching my hiring decisions and uh, thinking about how to build a team and, and who, to, who to bring on in terms of how do they add to my culture? How do they, what do they bring to the table that's going to change things up in a way that's really great? Um, and if you don't have a specific reason for adding that person, if it's just to add to your headcount to fill a quota that the business from a top-down level has, has allocated to you, uh, then maybe you should think twice about you know, what's happening. Um, but if you can f- find a, a, a reason, a culture ad reason for hiring that person, then I think uh, it's a good hire. I look at I look at several things, and I think culture is, is a huge one. I look I look at kind of general cognitive ability. Uh, you know, how smart are they? Are they going to be able to solve difficult problems? Their ability to do the actual job in question, um, which is I think secondary to most of the others. Uh, leadership ability, which I think is a huge one. Uh, you know, because we're we're putting people in in really difficult situations where they have to lead their teams through it. Uh, and then and then just kind of like I said, the um, like uh, Spencer said, the the culture. Uh, you know, are, are they are they going to be missionaries? Um, are they going to kind of go after this, um, taking this hill uh, and, and drive their, themselves and those around them to actually do that? Uh, I think that's often that passion is more important. In fact, I'll, I'll take people that have that passion, um, even if they're a little bit lacking in, in their their ability to do the job, because I trust that they'll be able to to figure that that piece out. Mm. Yes, so cultural aspect for me is also the most important um, cultural cultural ad or cultural fit. Uh, so <laughs> both, but uh, I think this part is really um, what makes the difference. Um, of course, we need to have some skills in place, etc. But um, for me, it's more important that person has uh, awareness about their ability to learn and that they have that they want to learn. A mission fit over a cultural fit is basically what you guys are saying. That's one of the things that we follow here at, at Plural Side also is, is, you know, the passion and the mission and where people are directed is more important than anything else. How do you guys uh, balance and prioritize things like learning time for your teams? Obviously, um, in technical positions, there's a ton of technical things that need to be learned and mastered yesterday. Um, so how do you balance that out with you know, time actually working. Like Dragon, you mentioned that 80%, you know, work and 20% meetings. What part of that percentage should be learning time for learning new skills? What I think that learning is is in those 80%. So the only thing I, um, for me, uh, this works is if I treat uh, learning time as any other working uh, tasks on you know, planning horizon. So basically, um, as you mentioned, if something, if you, if I'm deciding today whether somebody is going to learn something or deliver something concrete, some feature that is uh, needed for the deadline, always the second uh, thing will win. So uh, basically, I think it's much more easier to plan, to negotiate, and to prioritize uh, learning activities if we do it. Uh, from the long-term perspective. So do it in time, get buying of, of uh, people who are deciding about prioritization, uh, get those priorities listed, and then um, to treat it as any other uh, working task. Because if we don't do so, then um, of course, uh, we are creating other kind of problem. You know, what's interesting is that I, nobody on my team has has hit the uh, the the boundary yet. Um, I, I would actually, I want them to, con- I want them to push for more. Um, I've never per- turned down any request for learning or for or for training or or for expanding horizons. I I, I actually think that the 
uh, at least on my team, I'm not seeing enough of it. I, th I think I think people should should ask for more. Um, you know, for example, we did a, a test driven development um, training and and, you know, several engineers came and said, we want to do a hackathon to figure out how we can transition to test driven development. And I was all for it and said, hey, all the rest of the teams, let's, let's all do this. And and anybody that came to me and asked, it was it was I was more than happy to do that. I, I think I, I want teams to be to be passionate about learning and improving. So I think everyone uh, wants that. And I think that people we have industry that we are working uh, in is basically we are very lucky because people are very curious. They want to learn. At least this is my experience in my whole career. Most of people I worked with, they wanted to learn new things. They wanted to implement new things. They are just they are sometimes <coughs> motivated just by technology, you know. So uh, this is I think in my experience, I've never felt this is lacking. Uh, so uh, Basically, then it's about um, just fitting it in with some regular delivery stuff, you know. How do you create a psychologically safe workplace? Now, this is some, something that I know has, has been brought up a lot over the last few years. Um, and I, it's kind of part of the DevOps thing, if you will. Um, but how do you create a, a psychologically safe workplace where people feel safe to, to be honest with each other? I think I think it ultimately comes down to to vulnerability. Um, so I, I, I think we need to model that behavior, uh, and we and we need to own. Um, you know, for example, we're going through this transformation, and there's been a couple of times when I've stood up in front of the team and said, "You know what? We we got this wrong. I got this wrong. Um, I I thought that this was going to turn out like this, and it didn't. And I'm I'm going to own that. Um, but we're iterating to success together, and that's okay." It's okay that I got it wrong um, because what, this is what we learned, and 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 everybody needs to know that that we're going to fail. It's just the nature of it. But if we if we learn from that failure and, and move forward, then 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 uh, that's how we get to the our, our best place. And the converse of that, where you're trying to find blame, absolutely kills psychological safety. Um, and then nobody wants to take any sort of risk. Um, so yeah, I think I think vulnerability is the key. I would describe it as shifting the focus from uh, the execution uh, to learning. So we, of course, do the execution, but uh, as if we fail, this is fine, as long as we learn from failure. So uh, I think this is the key. And I think it's also important that we as leaders also show um, our, all, our own mistakes to openly share this because it just encourages everyone else to do the same. And it's also about... Um, just simple conversation, you know, ask people, talk to people, actively listen. So when people feel this kind of atmosphere, then they will also feel this safety, you know. I seriously just love what's been shared. Um, Brene Brown, I don't know if you've, you've heard of that author, but uh, maybe Michael uh, has, but, you know, talks all about vulnerability. And it's just something me and my wife talk about this all the time in a business context, in a personal context, um, really great principles. Um, just to add on to that, I mean, our, our company, uh, you know, Tava, literally we sell a mental health benefit to employers to give to their employees for people that are struggling. And it's totally free for the employees, right? Um, and uh, it's just becoming more and more clear the longer I spend in this company that just everybody has something going on. And this is a little bit more of a, a personal, you know, kind of approach, but but as a manager, I, uh, whether it's you know managing several teams or just managing a small team, whatever, uh, I think it's it's important to to understand those facts and to understand that statistically, someone on your team, including yourself, is probably dealing with something, uh, whether it be family or or work stress or anything like that, that they should probably um, get some help for. And and I and I think a specific uh, example of what I've tried to do with my teams is with our one on ones. Um, I'm a huge believer, and and you know, maybe Michael and Drew are going to have different opinions, but I'm a big believer in focusing on people instead of projects during one-on-ones. Um, my least favorite one-on-ones ever when I was kind of on the receiving end of them was uh, when they, we just talked about the business the whole time. What projects are you working on? How's it going? Uh, are you going to deliver it? Yes or no? Uh, so when I had the opportunity to start managing teams, it was I flipped it, and I really just focused on the individual, and I communicated specifically that, I'm here to talk about how you're doing at work and love to hear about it. We don't have to talk about projects at all. And uh, it's fine if it came up. Um, but that led to some really, really um, 
beneficial conversations, I think, for both both parties and um, started to surface, uh, started to help build real friendships, honestly, at work. And I think that's what people need. If you're spending most of your waking hours in a professional environment, you should probably have some personal connections with people that are meaningful. Um, so I, th I think that can really help on the psychological safety front. Go ahead and open this up for questions from our group here. When a scrum team has contributors from different managers, how do you increase or drive the motivation of team members specific to one department that's a bottleneck of the team? For example, if dev isn't producing when QA and BA are ahead and waiting. Yeah, I, I think the best way to do this is, is what we've been talking about with, with, with ownership. Um, if, if these are scrum teams in name only, uh, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot to begin with. Um, and, and frankly, it's not going to be successful. But, but if, if, if they're actual scrum teams where, where the engineers, the, the, the QA, and they're all aligned around one common goal and that's their focus and that's their job, um, then it, it actually becomes pretty clear pretty quickly. Hey, we got a bottleneck with engineering, or we have a bottleneck with QA. Um, and then it, you know, and then I think you need to work those out together. If, if it's if it's a resource issue, then you need to have that conversation with, hey, we we just really need more engineers. If it's a performance issue, uh, then you know, then you have to have those hard conversations, uh, and you, and you have to, you know, and that that's that's kind of the flip side of vulnerability. Like you have to you have to own your part, but then you also have to own um, what everybody else is doing and and ensuring that they understand what the expectations are. Yeah. Um, so you know, kind of talking behind their back or just you know, smack talking engineering, like, oh man, they, they never deliver or product never gives us the requirements. It's not going to solve it. I think that really the beauty of Scrum teams is this collective ownership. Uh, so um, what I would do in this situation, so this is definitely something that is not a particular issue of these persons from a bottleneck department, but this is something to be, be discussed within the team. And this is something to be brought to retrospective. And luckily those people who are in the team already know the solution. You just need to let them, you know, em to emerge uh, the solution. So uh, when team comes with some collective finding about what is the best way to deal with this problem, then I think this should be definitely propagated to appropriate manager of a department or whatever in case solution is related to that department. Maybe solution is completely different. Maybe it's just that the process needs to be adjusted a bit or, you know, so it can be a lot of different things. But if needs to be communicated also within the department and the person who is responsible for this, then this is also a way to go. So. And I think I think that retrospective idea is 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 key. It's not about finding blame. It's not about oh the engineers suck or whatever else. It's it's okay. What is the problem? We're not trying to point fingers. We're just trying to identify the problem and learn from it. And any team that does that over and over again will fix the problems. Awesome. And one thing that I've seen in the past that's worked well is having liaisons on teams. So you would have somebody from another team come to your stand-up, say, once a week. So we have five stand-ups a week. Um, and one day a week, we'd have someone from database engineering. One day, we'd have someone from graphic design. One day, we'd have someone from product. And each of those people would sit in our stand-up and just kind of listen. It's kind of the pigs and chickens thing, you know, where they would just be an observer. They wouldn't take part in any of the ceremonies, but just kind of take it in. And then, you know, I would go to another team and take it in. And after a while, that ownership starts to kind of inherently mm. develop to where people are like, no, I, I hung out with those product teams and they're struggling with this and this and this. Maybe here's a way we can help. Is that something that that you folks have seen also? Yes, yes. I've seen this a lot. Uh, I've seen uh, something like this also um, because somehow Scrum Masters are always um, mostly oriented towards the making things work and um, uh, towards the process, etc. Uh, what we also sometimes do is that um, my colleagues are shifting uh, also coming to, to um, stand up of uh, different team, etc. Just somebody who is completely, you know, from different context comes and sometimes instantly can see something that the team is struggling with or something like that. But also in some scaling environments, we go even a step further. For example, in a uh, less environment, you have a concept of travelers where people actually, you borrow a team member from another team for uh, one iteration or two iterations or something like that. 
and then basically uh, you can have their feedback, you can um, learn some additional things that maybe you do not have enough competence in your team to uh, to do that, but then you gain that knowledge, et cetera. So there are some nice mechanisms around it. I think there's also a reason why the most successful teams are, are small, two pizza teams, and they're co-located just because of of the way human beings are, if we if we know the person, it's it's very. If we don't know the person, it's easy to revert to us versus them. Um, and and ultimately, most most team issues are are people issues. Um, and 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 if if you're just the very act of being co-located and and actually knowing the person and um, and and actually caring about that that person as a person. Uh, I think that's 70% of, of, of the battle to make a team successful. Um, and it's, it's really easy if they're in a different location and you don't actually know them and you've never met them. It's easy to, to, you know, to, to think that, that they suck in some way that, or that, you know, that they're not giving you what you need when it's usually actually not the case at all. Uh, but what I uh, do when I work with distributed teams, so I, um, almost always from time to time bring people together, you know, so people just yes. travel uh, to the same location and then spend maybe one iteration or let's say quarterly they meet for the release planning or something. And then you have this bond developed that it's much smoother later to work, you know, online. Exactly. And, uh, What's your opinion of the impact of the human aspects of machine learning and automation becoming more important? How does an organization deal with this from a culture perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I can speak to autom automation, um, and actually, and machine learning. We're, we're, we're doing quite a lot there. Um, I view automation and machine learning as as freeing up the humans to do the interesting work. Um, so I've got I've got a large QA team. I want them to do qualitative um, uh, testing. I want them to really understand the customer. I don't want them to find something that uh, that a machine can find. Um, at the same time, you know, I want I want to use machine learning to to create a better curated experience for our customers uh, in a way that, uh, that that humans can't. But it's it's ultimately about I think curating um, and and concentrating and focusing um, the the best value, which is which comes from the humans. Um, so I, I, that's why I, I view machine learning and, and automation is that it's. It's about kind of focusing that that effort so you're getting the most out of out of your most valuable assets, which are which are the people, the folks that work on your team. I think that um, impact is positive in my opinion, uh, because people do more the, the work that is more interesting, etc. If you look, uh, for example, at the QA teams, um, they shift from some boring repetitive work to um, making more abstract things to creating some frameworks to cr to do automation and i think people love it so people in technology just love to learn and uh, love to experiment so i think it's it's a good thing i'm torn in two directions one of the directions is to think about the sci-fi and and articles that i've read about about you know aut autonomy uh, automation and machine learning and ai and um, i mean it's something that in our in the cultural zeitgeist is extremely uh, popular and uh, is on everyone's minds. Um, but then the other direction was, well, how does it affect my business? And how does it affect the day-to-day -day of my people? And um, I think the answers that have been given already are, uh, are, are great. I, maybe I would add like, um, I don't know, within the context of a business, it, it seems like, uh, and maybe the question was, maybe the question was geared around, oh, what happens when automation upends the the work of, of people in the business what happens then i think that's a that's a pretty common sort of sentiment and question i think that we're wrestling with as a society honestly um so i, I won't make any any statements or any uh predictions there but i, I think that in a business context like it, um you automate what you can and if and if you can hire engineers that can automate all those things then you won't have to hire any more and uh so it, it doesn't seem likely that unless you're in a very large business that it will super affect it. Um, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I think it's also creating a range of new, you know, positions and new roles, etc. So it's if we look at the industrial revolution, people were breaking machines because they thought they will lose their Not jobs. <laughs> and Thanks. look where we are. So things just become more interesting and yeah, there is a lot of new things to do, so it's fine. So if 
it is a performance issue. Who brings it up to who to have those tough conversations? It's a question from there. Yeah, well, I, I think if you have performance issue uh, in the team, for example, and if this is not naturally brought up to the surface during the regular team work, so something is wrong with this team and you have more issues than just this concrete performance issue. So um, I think it's about making teams really, um, uh, how can I put it? Uh, transparent, open, and people are smart. They know if they have performance issues. So, um, but if you're really in a situation that, um, yeah, uh, you have performance issue, everybody is just silent about it, etc., then definitely bring it up. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it's. I think that goes back to psychological safety. Honestly, um, I, I, I think if if there's a performance issue, the sooner you bring it up, the better. Um, and psychological safety doesn't mean you don't have hard conversations and it doesn't mean that you're not direct and it doesn't mean that you don't say things that need to be said that might be difficult. Um, in fact, I think it means the opposite. I think it means mm -hmm. that you're giving direct feedback frequently. Um, I think I think it's a failure of management if, if a performance issue is brought up that's been happening for a long time and it's a surprise. This person should know. Um, and they should be receiving coaching and, and training and, and whatever to either address the, the attitude problem or the aptitude problem um, so that they can perform. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think early and often is, is, is really the key. I think developing emotional intelligence as a manager um, is something that is just, just so important um, in, in the workplace today. Uh, and, and honestly, when we're talking about, you know, careers and, and successful careers and things like that, I think that's a great differentiator as a manager, as someone who you know, um, you're trying to level up in your career, like people love that um, and they can notice that in you. And so that's one piece of advice I would give is, you know, as you learn that and as you honestly market that emotional intelligence that you that you you are able to talk to people about hard things in a psychological safe, psychologically safe way. Um, uh, what what better way to differentiate yourself? The person who is most resistant is often the one who's been around the longest. Can you discuss other options you've used to overcome this, especially when that person is great at what they currently do. Yeah, I, I think when you're driving change, it's really important to to highlight folks that are doing it right, um, and 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 to find champions and evangelists. Uh, so I think I, I think some ways that I've that I've seen this work is 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 take some of those folks that may be naysayers. In fact, on my team. I did exactly this. There was this gentleman that's been here uh, on the team for a long time. We were moving to cross-functional teams and he was very vocal about, oh, this is just gonna increase silos. I spent time talking to him, understanding his concerns, trying to understand what he thought the risks were. Um, we looked at some data, you know, I, I had him read some things. He's now our biggest proponent. Um, he's now the one that's driving it. Um, so I, I think if, if they're true leaders and they really want to kind of move in that direction and and and, are, and, and achieve that vision, I think you can co-opt them and, and use them to, to drive the vision. Uh, I agree with uh, Michael. And I also want to point out something. So I think it's very important if you have somebody who is resisting a change or giving any kind of resistance that is not desirable, that it's very important to understand why. So we should really build an uh, empathic relationship with our employees. So sometimes you can also get surprised because if you speak to somebody and if you really speak about that why, maybe you will discover that you have some blind spots. Maybe this person sees something that other people do not see or reasons are completely personal and they just want to resist the change. But when you have this answer to why, it's it, it's very important. I, it's starting point for uh, yeah moving on. And as Michael mentioned, Later, this person can be actually somebody who is leading the change in the end if you come to, to the same ground. So. Yeah. They also may be, uh, in, in some cases, may feel threatened by someone who is potentially younger, faster, newer, knows knows all the latest, greatest, hottest tech or whatever. Um, I, I think that can definitely happen, too, where it's a little bit of defensiveness just because they don't. They feel a little bit intimidated maybe by... Um, somebody on the team or the makeup of the team. Um, in which case, I think, again, going back to Dragon, I think it's just understanding why they feel that way. And if you do, then um, I, I think it's fine to, to focus, to say, listen, 
you might not know uh, the next, you know, minor version, what, what's, what's included in the next minor version of a software package and how we can use it or something. Uh, but you do have this experience that we can leverage. And how can we balance your skills with other people's skills and, and really make it a win for them instead of uh, kind of a comparison and it's a win or lose. Yeah, because oftentimes they're the most passionate also. <laughs> so right. they, they may be resistors, but at the same time, they're they're often the most passionate. So, um, yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense trying to kind of challenge them and challenge, channel them into being an advocate. Uh, my company has had some challenges with implementing OKRs. The team understands the value, but it's become a, ver a burden or an afterthought. I would like to understand more about how to use impact mapping. I can explain in short terms. So um, impact mapping is about, okay, understanding business goals, understanding who are the main actors to achieve the business goals, and what are deliverables that are uh, related to that. And then what are the assumptions behind it? Once you have this map in place, uh, then you validate assumption and you update it regularly. Uh, but how is actually how uh, this is related to OKRs? So in the same way that OKRs have connection of uh, each individual goal with company uh, objectives and goals, uh, also with uh, impact mapping, you have the goal of the product, you have then deliverables that will help to achieve these goals, and then you have individual uh, assignments of teams. So here we are more talking about collective assignment, team assignment rather than individual assignment, but in, in the organization, you can easily, um, yes, relate this to people, personal plans, etc. So, um, it's, I think it's more simple and, um, yeah, it's just, uh, you can Google it. Um, it's simple technique that I think it's very nice. And one good thing about impact mapping is that it maps directly down ultimately to, fe to fe feature ideas. Cause you're like, uh, mm -hmm. if I can get this actor to have this behavior, I know it will impact this goal. Mm -hmm. And so yes. I, I, it, it kind of helps you focus yeah. um, your hypotheses around features. Yeah. And it's dynamic. So you continuously validate assumptions behind. So uh, impact mapping just accepts that goals are also something that, uh, not goals, but uh, basically uh, our approach to achieving the goals is something that can be changed. Goals, of, of course, also, but, uh, and then if you want to connect it with um, teamwork, it also very nicely fits with user story mapping, which is another technique for agile teams to basically um, create their, let's say, backlog. Uh, but uh, it fits nicely together because impact mapping is more on high level. It gets you to the level of deliverables uh, that are pretty much, um, uh, let's say, still abstract. And then you can combine this with user story mapping, which brings it down really to like product backlog items of uh, teams. It's very interesting. I'll have to look at that some more. So um, do you folks have any final thoughts you want to share with our with our audience before we wrap it up? No, I, th I think that uh, there's a lot of changes um, happening in the industry. Um, I, you know, I think everybody's trying to move towards outcomes. Um, and, and I, if uh, you know, I think it's, it's it, there are ways that you can figure out if, if the company that you're interested in or, or if your company is really approaching this appropriately. Um, and, and I think there's ways to be change agents to kind of drive some of these changes. Um, yeah, but I think it's critical that we move to uh, to customer validated uh, outcomes over outputs. Yeah, if I can give one final thought after all that we discussed, I think um, that in general we've also touched upon some techniques and uh, approaches and things like that. But it's all about people. So whatever you want to achieve, just speak to people. So it's about transparency and openness. And um, after all years that I spent in, in my career, this is something that is always the true, you know? So it's always about uh, people and their happiness and uh, basically being open to, to your team. Thank you for listening to All Hands on Tech. You can find show notes and more info at pluralsight.com slash podcast. If you're interested in watching a video version of today's discussion, we'll include a link to that in the show notes. If you're interested in reading or listening to our recently released book, Perspectives on Technology Skill Development, we've included links in the show notes to access the book for free. 
Thank you and have a great rest of your day.